Dann bleibt er bei. Okay. okay. So, gut auf den Nonne. Ja, very glad and honored to have Professor Skidelis here. And uh, I'm not going to spend uh, too much time to use him, just saying that we are very glad and honored to have you here. And uh, he's an emeritus professor of political economy at the University of Warwick. He wrote so many books uh, and uh, you know the, the he's well known and uh, you know that uh, many of uh, of his books uh, got uh, uh, a lot of, uh, of prizes like the biography of uh, of Keynes so i'm not uh, i'm not going to spend uh, too much time uh, introducing uh, the, uh, the 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 scientific work uh, of uh, of, uh, of professor Sk uh, skidelsky and uh, i'm just uh, giving the floor to to him and just want to mention that uh, he's giving this four lecture on uh, on uh, on Keynes in history. The first lecture is uh, on uh, Keynes as philosopher. The second one, uh, Keynes as economic theorist, and uh, the third one, uh, Keynes as a policymaker, and the fourth one, Keynes as a visionary. So we are looking forward uh, to hearing uh, your lectures and thank you very much uh, for being here. I'm very glad uh, to have you here in this uh, series of lecture of the PhD in economics of Santana School. Please. Thank you, Martin. Um, thank you very much, Professor Moneta. Um, thank you for asking me. I'm very um, pleased to be here. It's my, I think, fourth visit to Santa Ana, uh, Santana, and uh, most of you won't have been here um, um, when I first came, which was in, I think, 2016. And I gave some lectures at that time in the um, after, um, after the financial crisis. It was sort of looking at the events and developments after the financial crisis of 2008-2009. Um, and I always liked, uh, I liked your university very much. Some of my good friends that I made at that time, I still see. Um, one of them is going to be here tomorrow. Um, and also, um, I, I like Pisa very much, and I'm very happy to be here. In fact, it's rather appropriate in some way that um, I'm lecturing on Keynes in Pisa um, because there were strong medieval elements in Keynes's thought which uh, most people don't realize, um, but they're there. And I hope I'll bring them out as um, uh, the course of lectures proceeds. As um, Professor Moneta said, um, there'll be a series of four, which I hope will link up Keynes's philosophy, which he developed as a young man, uh, and his uh, mature economic writings. There seems to be you know, if you want to draw a regression line through his thoughts, you have to start when he was about 15. And then um, you work all your way through to the, uh, um, his uh, work um, on Bretton Woods at the end of his life. So um, let's, let's get going. Um, so um, what I want to do is to, in, in, this, in these lectures, is to place Keynes in history. Uh, the history of economic thought, the history of policy, and just history. He was a history maker, not a history taker. Our conventional view of history is much too restricted. We think of history as um, the arena of action of a particular kind of actor, um, whether it's soldiers, statesmen, armies, crowds, uh, whereas in fact, um, uh, People in, the and people in the business of ideas aren't usually thought of as actors. This is a very odd idea because we all know that ideas are what animates these other actors. And politicians never have any ideas themselves. They're consumers of ideas. And, um, and, and, and armies don't march um, without ideas. If so, they'd just be dead matter or lifeless matter. So ideas are the most important thing. 
And um, Keynes understood the power of ideas. Ideas are a, a, a source of power. And I've got a quotation which is very well known. Well, so first of all, uh, uh, I think I'm doing something right. But so this is the um, this is the uh, um, plan of this lecture. Um, so we deal with the philosophic foundations all the way through, and then at the end with some contemporary applications. Can you see that? And then on the power of ideas, here we go. You know this, well, maybe you don't know it, maybe you do know this quotation. It's a, one that's often used. The ideas of economists and philosophers, both when they're right and when they're wrong, are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed, the world is um, ruled by little else, practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influences are usually, that's ironic, I shall come to Keynes' use of irony, which is a very important part of his uh, persuasive power, are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. Madmen in authority who hear voices in the air are distilling their frenzy from some academic scribbler of a few years back. Um, now, I don't think Marx, Karl Marx, would have quite have agreed with that. He would have said that ideas are a kind of superstructure um, and without autonomous effect, you have to always look at the uh, class struggle um, uh, in order to understand uh, what what the ideas are, he, he would have said the ideas in any epoch, in fact, he did say this, are the ideas of the ruling class. So they have lack an essential degree of autonomy. That would have been Karl Marx's view. I mean, I know I'm putting it very simple and uh, simple, simply, and Karl Marx himself was a much more complex thinker than that. But um, there's, a, there's a basic contrast, which you should note at the start between Keynes's view of ideas and Marx's view of ideas. For Keynes, ideas were independent historical forces. Now, um, as I say, historians are uncomfortable with ideas, but that's, um, if I can interject a personal note, that's never been the case with me. Um, when my first book, Politicians in the Slump, was published, a long, long time ago, one of the reviewers wrote, and I quote, he shows an interest unusual in a historian in the ideas themselves. When I came to write about Keynes, I felt I needed to understand his ideas to make sense of his work. Um, and that meant studying economics and philosophy. So in this series of four classes, I um, try to speak as a historian and as an economist and as a philosopher with varying success because it's a broad canvas it's a, a broad win wingspan um Haynes was a historical actor in five senses first he was one of the most influential civil servants of his day um, according to Professor Don Mogridge, who's also written about Keynes, he had a civil service mind. So that's point one. Uh, and um, second, Keynes created a new field in economics, macroeconomics. There was no macroeconomics before Keynes. There was something called the theory of money, but Mainstream economics was microeconomics. Microeconomics plus the theory of money, which didn't quite fit. Um, so Keynes created a new branch of economics, which all students now study, um, which is macroeconomics. Third, um, um, there was the Keynesian revolution in policy. Um, his ideas helped make full employment for many years the main economic objective of governments. So there was the Keynesian revolution in theory, which was macroeconomics, and the Keynesian revolution in policy, which was the commitment to full employment. 
And that was crucial to the preservation of liberal democracy after the Second World War. He wrote in the general theory, you don't have to have fascism or communism in order to solve the unemployment problem. We can do it within a free society. So this was a very crucial point. If you, if you remember or think back to what was going on in, in his own lifetime. Fourth, he was a political actor in a direct sense in that he was the co-founder of the Bretton Woods system which was a set of institutions, international institutions, um, which were designed to make free trade possible and to make continuing current account imbalances impossible. And that was basically the framework for international monetary economics after the uh, Second World War and of international politics, because it just removed one source of conflict which in the 1930s had been economic nationalism and, and, and the struggle over currencies and trade. So there was a direct act of political creation with the United States. And as I've shown, he didn't really get his way at Bretton Woods, but you know he got a, some of his way. And fifthly, something we perhaps find it hard to remember today, he was the spokesperson of a great power um, when he was born in 1883, there was something called the Pax Britannica. And that was Britain. Britain was the most powerful country in the world. It had the largest empire, it had the largest navy, and it had the largest influence over what went on. Of course, there were other great powers, and you know, you can exaggerate it, but Britain was very, 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 it was a very important power. And he was speaking for Britain a lot of the time. By the time he died in 1946, British power had, of course, diminished quite a bit, but still Britain was one of the three great powers that came out of the Second World War. And um, uh, so Keynes wasn't an extraordinary mind in a small country. He was an extraordinary mind in a large country and a very important country. And he spoke to the rest of the world from quite a high level. And that's why you have a Keynesian revolution and not say a Kaletskian revolution. I mean, Mikhail Kaletsky was also had many of the same ideas, but he wrote and spoke in Poland. And no one at that time took any notice of what anyone said in Poland. I mean, you know, one's thinking of a different world, but this was the world in which Keynes um, made his mark, so to speak. Um, and also, of course, there were four or five universities in the world, the only ones that mattered, and two of them were Oxford and Cambridge. And Cambridge was where Keynes had his academic home. So this, this um, helps, I think, understand why um, Keynes was the person who changed economics and not someone else. He, he was in the right country, he wrote in the right language, and he, and he was located in the right place. Um, well, there's a joke, can I remember it? Maybe not, um, about Cambridge. Um, someone said um, time um, is uh, a device for preventing ev everything happening all at once. And someone else said, and Cambridge is a device for preventing everything happening at Cambridge. I mean, you know, uh, uh, for ensuring that everything happened at Cambridge. I haven't got the second bit of it right. It sounds better, but maybe you, you know this. But anyway, you, you know, if, if, if you know the correct um, bit, the second bit of it, uh, let me know. Now, um, let's start with the philosophic foundation. Cambridge is a device for preventing everything happening in one place. So, I mean, something like that. Now, let's go on to the next one. What? Well, maybe it's up. And oh, maybe Oxford was there to stop everything happening in Cambridge. That's that's how. Nice. <laughs> Thank you. That's that's my wife's memory is much better than mine. So look, look at this. 
Um, let's now go here. This is from my book. Philosophy provided the foundations of Keynes's life. It came before economics and the philosophy of ends came before um, the philosophy of means. Now, um, philosophy was the foundation chronologically and conceptually. Um, uh, his, uh, econ uh, econo he came to philosophy before he came to economics and philosophy framed his economics. Um, his philosophical commitments framed his economics. In, in the heyday of the Keynesian revolution, no one really paid any attention to his philosophy. You know, it's rather like Marx. No one paid any attention to Marxist philosophy until he f fell out of fashion. Then people rediscovered the early Marx, which was, you know, the Marx of the philosophic manuscripts. But before then, it had been the Marx of Das Kapital, volume one. No one ever read two and three. Similarly, Keynes was Keynes of the general theory. No one ever read Keynes's treatise on probability, for example. No one was interested. You got all you needed. But once the economics started not to be so w widely accepted, everyone said, well, why did they come to think the way they did? And people became much more interested in the philosophic foundations. Um, Um, and I think in that whole re reinterpretation or re-examination of Keynes's philosophy, an Italian scholar, Anna Carabelli, has played a very important part. Um, and uh, with a number of uh, scholars in the 1970s and 1980s, she's just, um, she just sent me a manuscript of a book um, called um, The... Uh, the, tra the, tra the tragedy of happiness. And that I understand exactly where that comes from in Keynes's own work. And she's been exploring this whole area of uh, early Keynes, not late Keynes, but early Keynes. Keynes's economics, I'd better read some of my, my uh, lecture now because otherwise I'll go rambling on for too long. But Keynes's economics was rooted in his epistemology, the epistemology of ends and the epistemology of means. He said, we know intuitively what is good, but we're uncertain about how to achieve it. This is the complete opposite of mainstream economics, which takes preferences as given and treats uncertainty as calculable risk. It's just the opposite. Keynes's epistemological commitments had a profound influence on his view of what our economics was for and how it was done. Um, now, mainstream e economists don't deny, of course, that politics can subvert um, economic optima. Of course, they don't deny that. But unlike Keynes, they do not try to adapt their analysis to the tasks and possibilities of politics. You have economics on one side and politics on another side, and there's a frontier. And this is true of all academic disciplines. They go as far as their frontier and leave it to others to sort of, you know, say something else. Maybe that's the only way to do science now. But of course, it wasn't the old way of doing science. Here's an interesting fact. Keynes was not a trained philosopher in the modern sense. So how did he get, how did he become a philosopher? Well, he, just growing up in a particular environment uh, in Cambridge in the 1880s and the 1890s, he picked up philosophy from his father, and his father's friends. And as a Cambridge undergraduate, from a small philosophically minded society, rather exclusive, called the Apostles. His father was a Cambridge uh, logician, best, very well known logician at the time. But um, what um, the person who I think made the greatest impact on um, Keynes's first ideas about moral philosophy he was a frequent visitor to his house called Henry Sidgwick. 
and Henry, Henry Sidgwick was a Knightbridge professor of moral philosophy at Cambridge. So you had all these people, logicians, philosophers, they all used to go, come there for dinner and Keynes would just be listening to everything, absorbing it all. I mean, these were the, the greatest minds in Victorian England. And they were talking about these sorts of things. There was, there was, and of course, another great mind who was also there um, was Alfred Marshall, who was really the, 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 the most famous late Victorian economist. Um, uh, so th that was the atmosphere in which he grew up. And of Henry Sidgwick, the professor of moral philosophy, Keynes, as quite a young man, wrote about him as follows. He never did anything but wonder whether Christianity was true, prove that it wasn't, and hope that it was. Um, Sidgwick's doubts were common to late Victorian intellectuals. And on, on Keynes's uh, mother's side, his, gran his grandfather from his mother's side was a famous Baptist preacher. He came from a very religious background, but on the way they lost their faith. Partly his father's generation, mother's generation, but even more so his own generation. And so what they had to do was to search for an authoritative theology substitute that could tell them what was good and what was bad. God was sort of removed from the conversation. So they had to find someone, something else. And his own quest for a theology substitute was um, found in a, a book that came out when he was uh, 20 called um, Principia Ethica by G. E. Moore. This was the Bible of Keynes's Cambridge generation. Well, let me say something about the Principia Ethica. Um, let's go back to the uh, lecture plan. G. E. Moore and Principia Ethica. What Moore did, and I think this is very, very important, you, 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 you obviously know that the dominant philosophic stream by late 19th century was utilitarianism. Utilitarianism had largely replaced deontology as a sort of dominant moral way of thinking about, about ethics. And what um, uh, Moore said was that good, good was a non-natural property which can only be known intuitively. And any attempt to identify good with some natural property, like happiness or some sensational, um, sensational feelings, subjective feelings, more called the naturalistic fallacy. In other words, subjective feeling was you cannot get to good simply by um, by um, sensational by sensations. In other words, it was a rejection of the utilitarian approach to just defining what is good. He said, you know it intuitively. Good, and what he said was good in itself, uh, the highest goods, things which were valuable in themselves, more called the uh, pleasures of friendship and the enjoyment of beautiful objects. And Keynes added to that one thing, which was the pursuit of knowledge. These were things that were good in themselves. How do we know it? We just know it. No, 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 no it wasn't God who told us. It's not because these were things that made us happy or, or anything. They were just good. And more added, it is only for the sake of these things, in order that as much of them as possible may at some time exist, that anyone can be justified in performing any public act whatsoever. Only this was the maximand, yes? Nothing else. Everything else was a means to the, these ends. In other words, economic well-being, so GDP, all those things were just means, they weren't ends. 
And this was absolutely central to the way this lot of people, including Keynes, thought about things. And to the end of his life, he said, and he said many times, Moore's Principia Ethica was my religion. Like all religions, it was difficult to live up to. And he also said, as time wore on, I fancy we weakened a bit about pleasure. Under this head, one could place the pleasures of sex, money making, and the pleasures of power. Um, Keynes was never a slave to consumption, but he certainly enjoyed the pleasures of sex, the pleasures of what he called business and bridge, just, you know, ordinary, ordinary common, common enjoyments of life, and with some misgivings, the pleasures of power. In other words, you could say he was Puritan, but he was Puritan in a very relaxed way. I mean, he wasn't one of these old, old style Puritans like his grandfather, or even his mother, perhaps. He was, you know, he, he was influenced by the loss of religious belief, but he wanted to find a theology substitute that would give meaning to his life. As a young man, Keynes believed that Christianity was nonsense, and that was typical of his generation. But as he, but as he grew older, his attitude to Christianity softened. And here, he is telling the poet T.S. Eliot, I would not demolish Christianity. You know, it's a lovely idea he could demolish Christianity himself. I would not demolish Christianity if it were proved that without it, morality was impossible. And then he tells, told Virginia Woolf, who is a writer, friend of his, I begin to see that our generation owed a great deal to our father's religion. And the young, who are brought up without it, will never get so much out of life. They're trivial, like dogs in their lust. We had the best of both worlds. This was at the age of 45, by this time 50. Um, we destroyed Christianity and yet had its benefits. And so if you're trying to place Keynes in the history of moral history of political thought what sort of tradition does he come out of it's as i see it much more in the tradition of christian social democracy rather than marxist socialism so i think you you've got to you've got to sort of um, uh, keep that that um, distinction in mind let me note three aspects of keynes's engagement with moore's ethics which were particularly influential for his economics. First, his rejection of the Benthamite greatest happiness principle. Happiness can be tragic. Um, GDP was but a means to goodness and its growth only justified in so far as it contributed to that end. Um, the idea of economic growth as an end in itself, as a good in itself, would have struck Keynes as absurd completely absurd and yet that is our gospel because we haven't got anything to put in its place really that's what we do whatever dangers it brings to the future of the planet to anything else, we just go on growing 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 and Keynes would have regarded that as completely unethical second there was Moore's doctrine of, of organic unity and this is absolutely central um, the interdependence of all social phenomena. The best of achievable states of affairs are bound to be complex wholes, uh, the value of which might be greater or lesser than the sum of their parts. In other words, Keynes rejected methodological individualism as a generally valid method of analysis in economics. The good of the macro economy is not equal to the sum of its individual units. And you can't understand key Keynes concepts in economics, like the fallacy of composition and the uh, a paradox of thrift, without understanding he had an organic view of society, not an atomistic view. Um, and um, 
and and so um i've just written up something here which really um comes from a, something he scribbled down at the age of about 15 or 16, 17. And I, I also do it there um, because this is, this is the sort of also, yeah, special case, general case. See, he thought G stands for good, but it could stand for any, any outcome of a collective kind that we might be interested in. And it's not, just that you add up individual bits of the out, outcome uh, and then uh, and get to the whole. It's that the outcome is the result of the interdependence of the, 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 the reaction, action and reaction of the individual units on each other. So that in fact, the outcome could be greater or lesser than the sum of the parts. And only in special cases will it be the sum of the parts. And, that was why he thought of classical economics as a special case of a general theory. This was the epistemological root of that. Right here, at the age of maybe he was 18 by this time. Um, but this is actually his, 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 his revelation, if you like. Um, and um, it, it, um, it, it's, 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 a, it's a very important. And, the doctrine of organic unity implied that good states of affairs on the whole can have tragic or bad elements and he gave lots of examples of this and not in his economic writing but also the fallacy of composition is crucial in his economic for example the dependence of pity which is good on suffering in order to have pity you must have suffering that's why robots who are you know can't suffer. I mean, the idea of robots suffering seems to all of us intuitively nonsense. But that is a human, that is a human thing. It's a, it's a good, it's a human good to feel pity at someone's suffering. But in order to feel pity, someone must have to suffer. Therefore, to aim at the greatest happiness of the greatest number in any in any in any crude sense and achieve it is to eliminate pity because there'll be no more pity there. and so he, he argues in this kind of way um right uh, in, in in various contexts and he says here i'm quoting um is this i wonder if i have a slide for this look at this Um, I'm not certain that all tragic states of affairs are bad on the whole, whenever everything, when, whenever everything has been taken into account, or that the goodness of the states of mind, let's say like pity or other, other good states of mind, if it is very great, may not outweigh the badness of the states of affairs. This is a very now uh, unfashionable view. Perhaps only only a Christian might feel that, but certainly no secular philosopher now feels that, I don't think. But if we're looking at Keynes in history, in the history of thought, we've got to remember, we've got to remember that that's what he said. It's an idea, of course, out of what kind of tradition does that come out of? First of all, it comes out of classical Greek thought. And secondly, it comes out of Christian thought. Now, the third way in which Moore impinged on Keynes uh, is in his uh, uh, theory of probability. And basically, Keynes rejected Moore's consequentialism. Keynes wrote about Moore, he had one foot on the threshold of a new heaven, that's his ethics, and the other foot in the Benthamite calculus, so what was going on here more separated ethics and morals he said the rightness of an action must be judged by its consequences that is that was more on his, Moore's theory of action the act the rightness of an action must be judged by its consequences this clearly depended 
on knowledge of those consequences. But while one could know re reasonably certainly the immediate effects of one's action, we could probably know what's going to happen with reasonable uncertainty in the next five minutes. We probably guess I'm not going to drop down dead in the next five minutes, but um, as a result of giving this lecture, but I might in the next 10 minutes. The probability therefore becomes less and less certain as you go further into the future. Uh, and this seemed to be an insuperable objection to any strict interpretation of consequentialism. We just don't know what's going to happen as we get further and further into the future. But that is exactly where investment and investment is always laying down money now in order to achieve a profit in five, 10, 15 years time, and except financial investment, which isn't really investment at all, but speculation. But sort of the kind of investment that Keynes was interested in does depend on um, if it's to be done on the scale required to um, achieve something like full employment or full, full, full employment of, of resources requires knowledge of the future. Now, if there's uncertainty about that, then of course you don't get it. And, and how can there be certainty? To believe there's certainty means you have to believe in a particular view of probability, probability as calculable and therefore hedgeable risk. And that's exactly what Keynes denied. Moore's own solution to this dilemma was what is known by philosophers as rule utilitarianism and which Keynes called convention. Um, the doctrine that um, um, the, the, the doctrine that following conventional rules produces better results on the whole than not following them. So this is how this is how through rule rule utilitarianism philosophers solve the problem that you don't have any real knowledge of the consequences of your own action. And Keynes actually rejected rule utilitarianism. Before heaven, he recalled, we claimed to be our own judge in our own case. Now, in claiming this, he invoked a very important philosophical principle, which is the principle of indifference or insufficient reason. Again, sorry, it's a bit complicated. I mean, this is the, I, I, I sort of, uh, you know, took a long time to know exactly what he was getting at. In acting on one's own individual judgment, it was sufficient to have no reason to believe that any immediate good we achieve for ourselves or others would be overturned by some a more distant consequence. In other words, you didn't have to have a full range of consequences in your head, you know, lined up um, um, uh, as uh, by time periods as you went into the future. You only had to have no reason to believe that anything you did now, which you thought was good, would be overturned by consequences uh, or adverse consequences later down the later down the path. That was the principle of insufficient reason. So, in other words, the rational actor didn't have to have before him a menu of probabilities stretching into an uh, indefinite future. In most cases, in most cases, trying to calculate the odds was a waste of time. This was the start of Keynes's attack on the frequency theory of probability. And between the ages of 20 and 30, nearly all his spare time uh, academic time was spent writing his treatise on probability in order to refute Moore's doctrine of rule utilitarianism, which he said was based on a false theory of probability, the frequency theory. Um, and that was eventually published in 1921, by which time he was already well established as an economist. It was basically written before the First World War and was only finally published in 1921. Um, and it was, you know, by that time, <clears throat> theories of probability had changed in various ways. And on the whole, it was neglected. 
But it was very important to understand um, Keynes's own thinking. And Keynes's alternative to the frequency of, of, um, of, of uh, frequency theory of probability was what he called the logical theory. That is, his aim was, as he said, to align probability to ordinary discourse through which practical conclusions for action are most frequently drawn. His father was a logician, and hence his theory of probability was an extension of his father's logic from the symbolic or syllogistic logic, which was then the uh, main, main, um, uh, main uh, theory of logic to include cases where conclusions cannot be deduced certainly from premises, but can be probably deduced from pre premises. And so that was, his, that was his theory of probability. And let me make it more concrete. The universe of discourse contained three types of probability. Numerical, where the probability lies between naught and zero and one. Non-numerical, where X is more or less likely to happen than Y, and unknown, due to lack of logical insight or, or, or uh, arguments that can't be uh, compared to each other. Very broadly, these applied to a succession of time periods. Numerical possibilities were a special case of a general theory of probability, most of whose members consisted of non-numerical and unknown probabilities. And he gives this example of a situation where even non-numerical probabilities are absent. Is our expectation of rain when we start out for a walk always more likely than not, or less likely as not, or as likely as not. I am prepared to argue that on some occasions, none of these things, none of these alternatives hold, and that it be an arbitrary matter to decide for or against the umbrella. If the barometer is high, but the clouds are black, it is not always rational. One should prevail, one should prevail over the other in our minds, or even that we should balance them, though it will be rational to allow caprice to determine us and waste no time on the debate. There's a theory of investment in, in that, um, and uh, we'll, 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 we'll come to it. Um, Keynes's theory of probability under, underpinned his theory of expectations which were very important. He, according to Hicks, Keynes introduced the method of expectations into economics. And if one thinks about it, there's no, the only reason for laying such stress on expectations is that they're uncertain. If the future were, were predictable, such terms as expectations and the state of confidence would be redundant, wouldn't they? Your expectations would be what, what about what, what what will happen. What, you don't have any expectations about what will happen. You know what will happen. Expectations only becomes pivotal in talking about investment decisions and decisions that stretch into the future. If indeed the future is unknown and you have to form expectations on some basis or other of what that future will be like. Um, and uh, everyone, you know, if you have probabilities, calculable probabilities, everyone will simply head. And this is exactly what mainstream models of financial markets, like the efficient market hypothesis, assume people do in defiance of what happens in the real world. And if that is actually a description if efficient mar uh, financial markets are a description of what happens in the real world, there'll never be any financial crisis. But mainstream economics doesn't believe that there ever will be financial crisis 
or rather, if there are financial crises, it's because something else has interfered with people's rational expectations. And um, this is something we can talk about, but uh, it always strikes me here is a big weakness in, in, in mainstream analysis of financial markets. Well, all right. This logical theory of probability never, never won complete support from other, other probability theories. We now sort of rely much more on subjective theory of probability, which is justified by application of Bayes' theorem. Um, in other words, an ideal Bayesian calculator is there in, in the back of our minds somewhere. Um, and so, but I'm not really interested, I'm not really concerned to defend Keynes' logical theory of probability at this, point, at this point, but to place it in the history of his economic thinking. That's all I'm really, two well-known passages um, uh, as by way of illustration. The first comes from the general theory where he attributes the instability of investment to the fact that most of our decisions to do something positive depend on spontaneous optimism rather than rational calculation. And remember the umbrella example here. Most investment decisions can only be taken as the result of animal spirits, of a spontaneous urge to action rather than inaction, and not as the outcome of a weighted average of quantitative benefits multiplied by quantitative probability. Thus, if the animal spirits are dim, enterprise will fade and die, though fears of loss may have a basis no more reasonable than hopes of profit had before. So, there's this idea of convention of underpinning everything. And so if the convention fails, then animal spirits sort of are doomed. And here's a second one. And this, pub is, this is from an article he wrote after the general theory, which you probably know, or some of you are students of Keynes know. By uncertain knowledge, let me explain. I do not mean merely to distinguish what is known for certain from what is only probable. The game of roulette is not subject in this sense to uncertainty. Even the weather is only moderately uncertain. The sense in which I'm using the term is that in which prospect of a European war is uncertain, or the price of copper and the rate of interest 20 years hence or the obsolescence of a new invention, or the position of private wealth hold owners in the social system in 1970. About these matters, there's no scientific basis on which to form any capital probability, whatever. We simply do not know. Nevertheless, the necessity for action compels us as practical men to do our best to overlook this awkward fact and to behave exactly as we should if we have behind us a good Benthamite calculation of a series of prospective advantages and disadvantages, each multiplied by the appropriate probability, waiting to be summed. Now, that is Keynes on, that's the epistemological basis of Keynes's um, theory of investment. And it also, this, uh, um, ep this epistemological commitment underpinned his very restricted use of mathematical formalism and his critique of econometrics, which I will come to in the next part of my lecture. He attacked mathematical models. I mean, economic students won't like him for this, perhaps as concoctions, mathematical models are concoctions, attempting to give spurious precision to matters essentially vague. Um, and his own, he hardly ever used mathematical models. Now, you may say at that point, mathematics wasn't nearly used as much in economics as it is now, and that is also true. But Keynes was a mathematical scholar. He could have used whatever mathematics he wanted if he thought that his economics would benefit from it. In fact, there's no single model, mathematical model 
in the general theory and only one graph which he put in at the insistence of one of his students um, rather reluctantly his style was one of what you might call rigor rigorous informality suitable to persuasion not to proof um here's a few nice things um which we could ponder pains on maths when you adopt perfectly precise language you're trying to express yourself the benefit of those who are incapable of thought the classic theorists resemble euclidean geometers in a non-euclidean world who discovering that in experience straight lines often meet rebuke the lines for not keeping straight Yet in truth, there is no remedy except to throw over the axiom of parallels and to work out a non-Euclidean geometry. Einstein was uh, a contemporary of Keynes, by the way. Something similar is required today in economics. So he was actually quite influenced by what Einstein was doing. Um, um, and he thought economics needed its Einstein as well. Um, well, he offered himself um, for that role. Um, and then here's a last quotation. Too large a proportion of mathematical economics are merely concoctions, as imprecise as the initial assumptions they, on which they rest, which allow the author to lose sight of the complexities and interdependencies of the real world in a maze of pretentious and unhelpful symbols. Yet I've, you know, I mean, there is now a standard, what you call training for an MPhil student in, in, and I had to, one time, read dozens and dozens and dozens of these, in which you simply, you have a, you have a premise, then you have a mathematical uh, 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 statement of it, and then you have some shady econometrics to sort of, you know, show that you're not, you know, what you're doing is some, somewhat worth, 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 worthwhile. And that's training. Now, I, I'm not against that as training, but of course, when you actually think that it tells you anything about the world at all, you're barking mad. And yet, actually, this is what the result of this training is for far too many uh, otherwise promising economists. They get sucked into this formalism and they can never really get out of it in the end. Um, yes, I mean, um, here, one of, one of Keynes's notable literary productions is called Essays in Persuasion, and the, the title of that is very important. I want to persuade you. I'm not going to prove that I'm right. I want to persuade you that this is the right way of looking at the world. Um, and, um, uh, and, and, and a key feature of Keynes's persuasive style was his use of irony. I think anyone, anyone reading Keynes, I mean, it's always a pleasure. Suddenly, in the midst of a quite sober set of arguments, you have this explosion of irony. Uh, and and he, makes, he, makes, he makes the opponent argument just seem ridiculous. Here we go. Let's, let's do it. He's a, a sound banker, alas, is not one who sees danger and avoids it, but one who, when he is ruined, is ruined in a conventional and orthodox way along with his fellows, so no one can really blame him. Um, and then here's another one, which is very important. It's curious how common sense, wriggling for, for, for an escape from absurd conclusions, has been apt to reach a, a preference for wholly wasteful forms of loan expenditure rather than for partly wasteful forms, which, because they're not wholly wasteful, tend to be judged on strict business principles. For example, unemployment relief financed by loans is more readily accepted than financing improvements at a charge below the current rate of interest. While the form of digging holes in the ground known as gold mining, which adds nothing to the real wealth of the world, is the most acceptable of all solutions. 
if everyone dug for gold, there never need to be any unemployment. Just or, or for example, if you had lots of wars, there wouldn't need to be any unemployment. You'd employment for the soldiers, employment for the gold diggers, and um, you'd have full employment of resources. Well, you know, I mean, it wouldn't be very valuable employment, but it would be employment. Um, and then he says, if the treasury were to fill old bottles with banknotes, bury them at suitable depths in disused coal mines, which are then filled up to the surface with town rubbish, and leave it to private enterprise on well-tried principles of laissez-faire to dig the notes up again, there need be no unemployment. Um, well, um, that's, uh, that comes straight out of the general theory. Now, critique of econometrics is my um, last substantive topic. Haynes's critique of econometrics of course, is rooted in his criticisms of the philosophic basis of induction in section five of his treatise on probability. Induction cannot be the foundation of knowledge, Haynes argues, since it requires the inductive hypothesis that induction is valid, which cannot be proved by induction. Very simple, straightforward argument. Um, in a review of the work of Jan Tinbergen, the um, father of e econometrics, Haynes pointed out that economics, because of the nature of its material, is a moral science requiring the constant exercise of a judgment by the economist in choosing and applying models. He queried Tinberger's logic in applying the method of multiple correlation to non-homogeneous material and his assumption of fixed coefficients over periods of time, which is, of course, very central in, in econometrics. Now, here we go. Um, this is Keynes. Is it claimed that there's a likelihood that the equations will work approximately next time? One can always cook a formula to fit moderately well a limited range of past facts. But what, what does this prove? What place is there for expectations and the state of confidence relating to the future? What place is allowed for non-numerical factors, such as inventions, politics, labor troubles, wars, earthquakes, financial crises? Um, and basically, he went on. Uh, Tinbergen's, Tinbergen's method omitted any causal role for psychology, expectations, unexpected events. It depends on inadequate statistics and blah, blah, blah. Again, Keynes's um, irony, Tinbergen's um, uh, basic, basic introduction to econometrics, he was the father of econometrics, was published in 1939, and it had been commissioned by the League of Nations, 1939. Keynes said, it's an extraordinary thought that this may be the only significant achievement of the League of Nations in 1939. War broke out in 1939, and the League of Nations was designed to prevent wars. So there's some irony in that. Um, so why was econometrics oversold as 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 as, as, a, as, a, as a set of uh, as as a, a falsifying procedure? Why was econometrics oversold? Keynes writes. In chemistry and physics, the object of the experiment is to fill in the actual values of the various quantities and factors appearing in the equation, and the work is then done. But in economics, that's not the case, and to convert a model into a quantitative formula is to destroy its usefulness as an instrument of thought. Now, here Keynes was really attacking economics as a science in, in, in the sense that physics is a science or chemistry is a science or perhaps biology is a science. He said economics isn't like that. Understanding nature's laws does not enable you to understand social law. Fundamental distinction in Keynes' is economics. Uh, the, 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 one of the founders of uh, social physics uh, was a Frenchman, Auguste Comte, um, and he wrote the laws governing social behavior are as definite as those determining the fall of an apple. 
the laws governing social behaviour are as definite as those determining the fall of an apple, in other words, as Newtonian laws. So what does Keynes comment on that? It is as though the fall of the apple to the ground depended on the apple's motives, on whether it's worth falling to the ground, and whether the ground wanted the apple to fall, and on mistaken calculations on the part of the apple as to how far it was from the centre of the earth. So the laws of social laws are not like Newtonian laws. But mainstream economics, I believe, continues to strive for the kind of Newtonian certainty in its account of um, economic behaviour. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, I mean, tell me that I'm wrong about this. Uh, but it seems to me that um, it hasn't read its um, origins, read itself of its origins in 18th century physics. And it never will. It can't. And therefore, at some point, maybe it's 30 years, 50 years, 100 years, it can be regarded as one of those quaint, obsolete intellectual pursuits that people once had. Um, and it'll be in the dustbin of old theories like phlogiston as a sort of theory of energy, galvanism, various things that people believed in at various times for odd reasons. Not yet, not in your lifetime. It was still all right. But I mean, eventually, that must be the case. Um, I'm being provocative here, of course. Now, let me turn to my last, uh, my last uh, uh, important, important uh, thing, and which is Keynes's doctrine of prudence. I'm sorry, I should go back to the first, uh, um, first um, outline of the lecture. Um, but the doctrine of prudence. Um, is very, very important. If propositions concerning the effects of actions couldn't be proved to be true or false, what then was the rational basis for public policy? That, I think, is the question Keynes now. Not for personal action, but for public policy. Keynes found it in Burke, Edmund Burke's doctrine of prudence, the principle of insufficient reason justifying recklessness in terms of personal ethics pointed to extreme caution in the making of public policy. And he wrote an 86-page essay on Burke, it's never been published, uh, in, in which um, he said, here is to be found the basis of, um, of, of, of public action. Here's what he writes. Our power of prediction is so slight our knowledge of remote consequences is so uncertain that it can seldom be right to sacrifice the well-being of a nation for a generation, to plunge whole communities in distress, or to destroy a benef beneficent institution for the sake of a supposed millennium in the comparatively remote future. We can never know enough to make the chance worth taking. And the fact that cataclysms in the past have sometimes inaugurated lasting benefits is no argument for cataclysms in general. And then he adds, in addition to the risk involved in any violent method of progress, there's the further consideration that is often in need of emphasis. It's not sufficient that the state which we seek to promote must be better than the state which preceded it. It must be sufficiently better to make up for the evils of the transition. All the things, very, very important things to ponder. For example, I've just written a finished a book, which is going to be published um, in October, um, on the relationship between humans and machines. And one of the um, main um, arguments for not bringing any stop uh, to technology, you know, automation. How many jobs uh, will automation uh, eat up? Hundreds of millions. They're endless forecasts of these things. Every day, there are new forecasts of new sets of jobs, all going to be eliminated. 
but they say that's fine because after the transition there will be better jobs and more creative jobs so we have to undergo the transition which may last 50 years or so you know a couple of generations but after that it will be wonderful there's Keynes on this in addition to the risk involved you know, there's a product that is often it's not sufficient the state which we seek to promote should be better than the state which preceded it it must be sufficiently better to make up for the evils of the transition there that's it who sacrificed two generations for the sake of a better future. What about revolutionaries who, who endorse violence, uh, violent overthrow of existing institutions, because in future it will be better. We'll have got rid of all these unjust states of affairs, and we will have bliss just beyond the horizon. Revolution, revolution, always, always, um, disregard the well welfare of the present for the sake of a better future which on a Keynesian kind of epistemology you can never be sure that it'll work out better so are you then um uh, do you then have to fall back on just conservatism that you know what is is the best that can be and you can't aim for any improvement that would be an extreme reading of Burke and in fact um uh, it, it it is the basis of conservatism but Keynes rejected that that um um uh, uh sort of uh he didn't think you need go that far but here's an application of Burke in Keynes's writing on international relations, which I think is very, very interesting in the 1930s. He writes, this is in 1937, right? At any moment in time, peace is better than war. Therefore, we should not risk war unless we know that it will make peace more secure in the future. And we should not fight a war unless we know that it will make a future peace sufficiently better than the existing peace to offset the costs of war. Therefore, we should prolong peace hour by hour, day by day, as long as we can. That attitude made Keynes a reluctant supporter of Chamberlain's policy of appeasing Hitler. So here's something else to discuss. He, he wasn't in uh, a died in the war of Berkeley. He wrote that Burke was so concerned to defend the outworks of the existing social system um, that, that he didn't see it might endanger, you know, a, a, a rigid conservative defense of everything um, in the present system uh, might actually cause the system to collapse. So you have to be an improving conservative. Flexible conservative. Well, um, I think that's all I'd want to say about the um, epistemological foundations of Keynes's economics. And I hope I've given you something to think about or discuss, whatever you want to do. And um, uh, tomorrow, I then talk about how he applies this in his economic theory. Thank you. questions comments yes please you get them I could like um thank you very much for the excellent presentation um I had a question on um you mentioned how Keynes thought highly of himself and his position and, and saw where he was um uh, did he see how important he would be in the future? Do you think he thought that uh, not only was he extremely influential, but there's more of a comeback throughout, throughout the time, and we're looking more and more at his work and influence 
And did he recognize that? Did he know that he'll have this importance? Thank you. Well, I don't know. I don't know whether that's so. I thought uh, when, when, um, when we had the um, financial crisis of 2008, 2009, I, um, I wrote a book called The Return of the Master. And um, I thought, well, you know, um, we're going to start taking more, 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 more notice of Keynes. Um, and then it turned out the master had returned for six months. And that return was very well expressed by Robert Lucas, um, who said, we're all Keynesians in the foxhole. In other words, when for some sad and un rather inexplicable reason, economies fall into you know, a big hole, then we turn to Keynes. But normally they shouldn't do that. Not if they follow my teachings, Robert Lucas says, or my, my models, that shouldn't happen. Um, so we're all Keynesians in the foxhole. When there's a crisis, it might be a COVID-19 crisis, a war crisis, for example, then Keynes comes in again um, as, as, as relevant for policy, but there's no theory behind it. It's just that in order to keep power, Politicians can't just allow the whole society to collapse. They can't allow the banking system to collapse, so they have to bail it out. And if uh, they stop, um, if, if they stop uh, um, half the population from working, as they did in, co in the COVID-19 crisis, they had to print a lot of money to, to make sure they don't starve to death. So in that sense, um, you could say, you could talk about some revival of Keynes, but in that sense, there's always been Keynes. You know, he sometimes said, look, um, what, I'm, what I'm urging is often just common sense, but common sense applied systematically, not just, you know, when things go seriously wrong. So there's this, there is this argument about Keynes's theory, whether it is a special case of a general theory, a case when things go, for unexplained reasons, go seriously wrong, or whether it is the general case of which classical economics is the special case, you see. I think it all gets down to this little teenage equation he wrote. Um, and that's the debate. I think macroeconomics is in a mess at the moment. Um, there's a post-Keynesian post economics. Um, there's also, um, you know, various pluralist, um, uh, you know, and people draw on different traditions, but there's no unified economics any longer because the mainstream is in a mess, but there's no articulate alternative to the mainstream of the kind, let's say Keynes provided in 1936, which for a time, for 30 or 40 years, the whole economics profession could unite around. So good, very good question, but you know, I'm afraid that's the way I'd answer it. I don't know, maybe, maybe um, you, you have a different answer, but worth talking about. Honestly, um, I, I don't get the skepticism of, of gains toward uh, econometrics uh, since we have seen that the theory of probability has been foundational in his thought. Uh, I, I don't get why he was like so against uh, econometrics. Was it against uh, the uh, econometrics of Tim Bergen? Uh, and the, or was it against uh, any formality in, in an empirical analysis? And in so, what is the 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 the, the lesson, the the the, the taking what that we have when we should uh, analyze uh, macroeconomic uh, phenomena? Uh, meaning, should we do only qualitative analysis, some case studies, uh, history, or? Can we actually quantify, or maybe, you know, with a different econometrics? 
yeah. because even in the general theory there is no much of no. empirics no i mean um what does one say I mean, these 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 criticisms of econometrics came right at the beginning of econometrics. I mean, they were criticisms of Tinbergen, and at that point, econ econometrics was not um, a, a a a prominent part of economics. I think the analyses would be uh, qualitative uh, more, um, and they weren't. Uh, one reason they weren't is that economic macroeconomic policy was not yet um, established. And therefore, people weren't actually interested to know what the quantitative outcomes of particular actions were uh, going to be, which you know, would, 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 would uh, require empirical, empirical testing. Um, time series were only sort of starting comparative um, comparative uh, um, uh, economics um, was still in its infancy. In other words, there had to be a much more, uh, there had to be much greater development of the statistical apparatus itself before you could really start thinking of using it uh, for, for um, uh, uh, quantitative, uh, using it quantitatively in order to infer the 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 action you know the consequences of what you were doing there was a more fundamental thing though i think which is keynes sort of was skeptical i mean two two fundamental things one is i think he um believed that it was only very rarely that you could apply a popperian criterion to the inductive material. In other words, it was only rarely in that you could falsify any particular chain of consequences which um, your econometrics might lead you to um, um, infer. And secondly, he doubted, I think, whether you could get a causal, any, any, any very satisfactory causal um, uh, series I mean, it's all, you can get lots of correlations, but he um, didn't think you could establish any really serious, uh, any quantitative um, uh, conclusions, partly because he thought that, you know, for reasons given in his foundational idea, that there were too many variables which you didn't really control and you didn't, you know, you didn't, therefore, what were you testing for? You might find some, um, some um, uh, uh, verification on one set of uh, variables you constructed, but then there were others you might have left out. And therefore, so I think he, 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 he didn't, he, he believed in statistics and the use of statistics and having a quantitative sense of what was happening but he was very skeptical about the use of statistics to predict the future i mean i think that might be the best way of putting it in other words to believe he was very skeptical about the belief that everything that will happen in the future has in some sense already happened and could be captured uh, and i think of course what's happened much further is that we now have much greater database which we can plug in to our entire econometric models. We have much, much greater calculating capacity. And all of this, uh, I think, had Keynes um, been sitting here um, and uh, with, with, with a knowledge of maths that's much better than mine, he would have still said, be skeptical about drawing strong conclusions from any econometric analysis you might um, uh, do. Uh, I think that's what he would have said. And he would have certainly not thought that this is what the whole of economics should be. But of course, he wouldn't have objected to many things that economists do. I mean, particularly, I think, also testing 
the efficacy of med 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 medicines and things of that kind, where we do use a lot of econometrics to just find out what's going on. Discussion. I mean, uh, yes, I'm very intrigued about uh, this discussion uh, about Keynes' view on both uh, probability and uh, and econometrics. So we have uh, two issues. Uh, so as you, as you mentioned, one is uh, the uh, Keynes' skeptical view about um, the the the, the capacity of uh, attaching numbers to probability. So his skeptical view about frequentism can be also phrased in terms of uh, skepticism uh, of uh, finding out probability distribution, of uh, estimating probability distribution. So it's difficult to predict because it's difficult to say what is the probability distribution that tomorrow is raining. Right? But we do attach numbers uh, to, to forecast in the in the real life or yeah. in, the, in, the, in our business so as economic agents and as uh, as human beings uh, when we are active in life so so and and also the discussion econometrics so uh, i i see and from historical point of view also would be curious uh, to see whether it is a skeptical view about uh, causal inference is uh, is connected about Causal inference, so the idea of uh, yeah. inferring uh, causal relationships from the right. So it seems it seems to me also in this uh, in this discussion with Tim Bergen that he is very skeptical. As as you said, I mean, uh, even if we had all the all the statistical tools of today, Keynes would be skeptical about the idea that from data, no matter so what tools you have. The idea of inferring, uh, okay, so if I intervene on this variable, have this effect on that? Who knows? So I think skeptical would, I mean, Keynes would remain very skeptical about uh, this, uh, this idea of this, uh, yes, I mean, uh, the, the possibility of, uh, of inferring a causal relationship from, uh, from, from empirical evidence. So my, my, my question is, uh, yes, first of all, if, uh, if uh, in this idea was uh, he influenced uh, by the Cambridge uh, environment, I'm thinking about Bertrand Russell. So Russell wrote uh, many things about causality and also Wittgenstein. So if uh, he was influenced in uh, in some way on this uh, skeptical view about about causal inference. And the second point is a little bit related with what Francesco was uh, was was saying that uh, okay, but uh, uh, so. I understand uh, as economist uh, that uh, we should be very skeptical about, uh, so we cannot prove causality. So we cannot really say, okay, I've touched this number. So I've estimated this parameter. So I, sh I should remain skeptical because I, I don't know if, uh, if this is really going to happen. But still, I mean, uh, also David Hume was very skeptical about causal, about induction and causal yeah. inference. Yeah. But, uh, as a, he was also an economist, by the way, and uh, so it was. Uh, it was. Uh, it was proposing uh, to see that uh, it was proposing the view that uh, as uh, as uh, as human being uh, in practice, we do apply these inductive methods. So I'm a little bit puzzled uh, by by this fact. So so I understand uh, the the idea of being skeptical, but then. Uh, um, I have the impression that uh, he may have uh, exaggerated a little bit uh, in this uh, in this discussion with Tim Bergen, uh, because uh, we I'm may be only searching for a notebook to take down <clears throat> um, to remember some of the points you're making. Okay, okay. Sorry. So he, he, we as as economists. Uh, we may still be interested in the idea of attaching numbers because in the, in, the, in the real life, we do attach numbers in your decision as economic agents, not only as economists, I mean, as economic agents, we do it in our daily life. So, and this is, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, very good. I mean, let, let me just try and find this. Um, uh, um, Uh, uh, what he says about 
numbers. Um, I think I think I actually haven't got it up as a slide, but it's his three classes of probabilities. I mean, he says there are three classes of probabilities. One, which are numerical, cardinal. Then there is ordinal. And then there's uncertainty. We don't just don't know. You're right when you say we do, and Keynes would have completely agreed, attach numbers to all of them. But only some of them would be valid. And it's because, he says, um, we have to act in some way. But we mustn't expect the numbers we attach to probabilities that are simply ordered to work out the way that we think they do. I mean, you know, he 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 gives the example is is blue more like green or yellow? I mean, you know, there are there's there's some things you can say which are they're more like this and others but you can't say green is twice as blue as um yeah i mean so he gives that's one of the examples he gives colors uh, is 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 uh, is an example so the thing is you do you're right you attach probabilities but they're conventions and that's why he thinks people will you you'll find in most markets or most um uh, uh you know economic decision making points people will have the same probabilities and that's because everyone else does so it's it it's it, it, it's 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 a spurious thing we do in order to save our faces as rational actors and then everyone's probability tends to be the same. And that's why you have these great swings where, you know, conventional opinion goes swings one way and then it swings another way. And that's why you also have um, the mainstream prediction. Um, banks. Now, central banks have become a bit more um, careful. They now have spreads things that might happen with the central prediction but that doesn't mean that it could go in a completely different way i mean the spreads are huge often in, in, in central bank spreadsheets of the say the effects of uh, a change in interest rate or even even if, even if you like what's what the, what the state of employment is going to be in, in a year's time there are different possibilities. I mean, our central bank said uh, by the end of 2024, unemployment, the central prediction is that unemployment will fall to 3%. But within, there is a range in which it's 10% and 2%. I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's safeguarding itself against the fact. I mean, it's just something we don't know. But you know, there is a, you, you, you go around all the think tanks, you go around all the institutes, you add up all their predictions and you get a central prediction. And, and, and usually the central predictions, uh, that's just answering your question. We do attach numbers, but Keynes would have said that we, we attach numbers because um, we want to save our faces as rational people, and therefore we attach the numbers that most people attach the numbers to. Why do they attach those numbers rather than other kinds of numbers? Well, um, they have some theory, they have whatever it is, they use whatever they can. Um, so that's point one. On the causality point, yes, I mean, you said exactly what you said, that you can't, that it's very, very rare. I mean, he would, I don't think that was a, a, a criticism of Keynes. I think it was really endorsing one of the Keynes' skepticisms about attaching causality to long chains with lots of variables that are, are maybe relevant to the outcome. And I think one, I don't know whether anyone is, has written an account of the relationship between Keynes and Popper. I know, um, of course, we know Keynes-Wittgenstein relationship. We know Keynes-Schraffer relationship, um, but not Keynes-Popper. Well, scientific falsifiability, I think Popper is the uh, most important 
uh, person. I don't. I, I'm not aware that Keynes was was knew the work of Popper, although Popper was writing at that time on the verification principle. Yeah, um, thank you very much for this uh, first uh, introduction. I think I will sort of poke you a little bit more in the direction that Alessio was sort of poking you towards. I was very struck by the quote you had about the umbrella, uh, because my sense is that there you sort of see Keynes in practice somehow. You see, uh, uh, in a certain sense, he exactly uh, that it it be an arbitrary matter to decide for or against the umbrella, because uh, um, here you sort of picture him uh, looking at the clouds, looking at the barometer. Uh, he could decide to go for you know an entire analysis of all the. Uh, uh, factors at play and stuff like that. And so he could go towards working out what the probability is also in a sort of cardinal sense of it rains, it doesn't rain. Uh, so you could have the weight of analysis, uh, but then he decides to go for the lightness of caprice, right? Uh, because it's, he decides that it doesn't matter. Right, he decides that it's not worth it to go into some kind of, uh, you know, in depth, heavy analysis of the situation. Uh, and you rightly say that this is a sort of uh, uh, theory of investments here, sort of looming around. Um, and so the question here is, um, how, how, where, where is the threshold? How do you decide that something is worth? the weight of analysis and how do you decide that it is just something that doesn't matter and you just leave to caprice? Uh, it's, it is something different, I think, from a, a theory of probability. It is more kind of a, I don't know, is it an intuition, is a sense of what uh, matters? How, how did he work out these uh, options, do you think? Well, you know, I think there's a, te there's a sort of tension in Keynes's work, isn't there? And I think there is, and, and it comes from his claim to freedom of action um, against sort of the Christian convention, you know? Okay. This, he was very, you know, they, they, were, they were early, early pioneers, this group, of all kinds of personal liberation. And what they were trying to do was to say, look, Christianity sets these moral um, moral standards for us. Christianity is based on false beliefs in God. Therefore, we should actually, um, unless there is independent reason for accepting the mora Christian morality, we have the right to our own freedom. So that was at the personal level. Um, um, we, 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 unless there's some other Unless there's an independent reason, independent of Christian moral, for um, following Christian moral practice, we should allow us our, ourselves to. Um, uh, we should allow we should allow um, uh, the decision to be a personal one. So that was this claim to extreme liberation and freedom. On the other hand, there was. Um, the idea uh, of what is rational to do um, when um, we don't have um, numbers. I mean, what is a rational person to do when they don't really know what the consequences of their actions should be? So I think the umbrella example is, on the one hand, um, it's you don't spend time working out numbers uh, when there aren't any numbers. Now, of course, 
you know, you can criticize that in all kinds of ways. There, there is, a, there are conventional, there's a conventional expectation. Let's say, I mean, if the if clouds are blacker, uh, if the blackness of the of the clouds seems to overweigh the heightness height of the barometer then you're not entirely acting on caprice. One thing is more likely than another. And so it's not completely caprice. You have some sort of basis that isn't just capricious. Um, so I think um, uh, you, would, you, would, you would say it, it is uh, rational. Then you get into to do one rather than the other, but then you get into a situation where you don't know. The, the arguments, what you would call a non-comparable, you can't trade them off in one, you know, along along a single line. Then he would say you would simply decide on a whim and not waste time working out numbers that don't exist. Now, of course, he doesn't apply this, you know, completely to to um, you know the theory of investment when he comes to general theory, which is written many years afterwards. But there. He does emphasize the uncertainty much more than um, the uh, more likely than not aspect. I mean, in the quotation about investment, he says, we simply don't know. Now, in that case, it's not exactly that we act on caprice. But what we do is what we act on a convention that the numbers are of a certain kind. And it's the flimsiness of the convention that actually produces the crisis. Because at a certain point, you start realizing that the numbers are spurious, the numbers in the convention. And then that then turns from an extreme of um, optimism, let's say, to an extreme of pessimism, which has no more, no more justification than the previous optimism. So I think it's that way um, he sort of thinks of um, these decisions that people make stretching over, you know, some period of time. You have a conventional way. You attach numbers because um, you, you know, you believe this is the only way of working out something rationally. And then you find the convention collapses and you swing from extreme optimism to extreme pessimism, none of which are justified. I'll say more about this, actually. Um, uh, tomorrow, uh, when I when I actually see how he applies some of these foundational um, principles to um, investment. Um, so I don't want to say too much um, in advance of that. It, it's it's very important for his theory of liquidity preference. That, that's where I want to sort of ask this particular question, answer this particular question. So you talked about uh, in the beginning how Keynes had, uh, especially in his 20s, um, relationships with uh, painters, writers, men. Um, he was influenced by a very um culturally diverse environment i would say in in cambridge um and you you emphasize how important this was uh for his development of of his philosophy and through his philosophy of his economic thought um and my question is uh do you believe this is in a way the missing uh factor today to develop a uh, realistic alternative to the mainstream economics, let's say. Um, and how do you think uh, economists today could, in a way, uh, reintroduce this um, interdisciplinary approach, but an intentional, unintentionally interdisciplinary, I would say, approach into economics? Well, you're given the answer, interdisciplinary. I mean, the curriculum must be set up in such a way People know something about things that aren't just economic. I mean, you know, you, I mean, so how do universities select people to read economics uh, degrees? Or how do people themselves decide that economics is going to be 
um, thing they want to spend time at. Often, people come to economics degrees from quite narrow uh, cultural. Well, who asked that last question? I can't see. Over there, from quite narrow cultural backgrounds, they haven't read Virginia Woolf or the Ita Italian cultural equivalents. So you, your own cultural background is very, very important. And then what you study at school, and especially just in the two or three years before going to university, what you study as an undergraduate course, first course. Oxford had a very good uh, course where you studied for your undergraduate um, degree. You studied philosophy, politics, and economics together for three years. Now, unfortunately, it deteriorated over time as as all, all our disciplines became much more much more specialized, and so people could give up the other two after a year and sort of go on specialize in economics, let's say, or in philosophy or politics. And so you didn't have enough of either. And the other thing was you didn't have teachers who could combine them for, for their students. You had the economists who came in to do the economics part of the talk and then and then you know the philosophers did their bit and then you know the scientists did their bit. And they all came from different faculties, different disciplines. And the student had to try and put it all together. And of course, most, I mean, students can't do that. They need help in finding where the links are and how the, you know, how the links work out. And that then guides them in their choice of what they want to do um, and where they can make the most effective impact on the world. And, and most economists now are not actually, they don't go into academic economies. They, the, the economics, they go into business or consultancy or they take jobs with private companies. Um, and there they're just required to do a certain, certain, certain thing. Now there's some companies um, which are rather um, perverse who say we will not take anyone uh, as a business consultant who is trained in economics because they will not know anything about the real world. Some companies do that, but not many. Um, so you've got to think in terms of how you set up a curriculum. I don't know, um, at Santa Ana, are most students here first degree or postgrad? Here. No. It's all in general. Yeah. Undergrads. Yes. Undergrads, maybe. Yeah, undergrads. PhD, yes. So I don't know what the you know I don't know what the undergraduate degree is. What it, what sort of studies it involved? That seems to me a very crucial answer. You can't get a broader approach to economics with alternative ideas if you haven't studied those ideas in some other way. You know, in some other discipline. And that will be about the application of this foundational framework to his economic theory. And we're going to come to, we're going to come to um, this uh, restaurant um, at 8 o'clock, is that right? I'm sorry to just ask for one more thing.